Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Lockney. I'm the Technology Transfer Program Executive out of NASA Headquarters. Uh, thank you for joining us. We have a really exciting uh, uh, show for you today. Uh, over the next one hour, we're going to hear about um, some potential secondary uses of NASA technology. And we have two inventors online, um, Mike Tinker and Fred Schramm, who are going to talk about some of their technologies. Uh, and then also a, a fellow from a company called Marbler, Dan Perez, who's going to talk to us about uh, crowdsourcing and ways to find other uses for our technologies. So as a quick overview, uh, NASA has a long-standing mandate to find these uh, spin-off applications for uh, the mission-driven technologies. So when, when Congress gives us the money for a mission, it says, don't just blast the money into space. Make sure that, that, that uh, the dollars come back down to Earth in the form of practical technologies and applications that benefit us here on Earth. Uh, and we've been doing this regularly for the past 50 years, and we've got some great examples of ways that, that we've done this successfully. For example, the um, little camera in your cell phone uh, was developed by a guy named Eric Fossum out of our Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech. Um, uh, he was working on digital imaging for deep space photography. Uh, so that, that became one of our spin-offs. So all of you have a little NASA technology in your pocket. Uh, similarly, um, uh, the, the examples of, of technology transfer are, are quite ubiquitous. Um, the uh, um, infant formula, for example, uh, little babies everywhere around the world are, are drinking NASA technology during long-duration uh, spaceflight experiments for um, uh, food sources. We were growing different algaes and testing them for nutritional content. And we discovered a, um, uh, a nutrient that had previously only been found in human breast milk. Uh, it's this fatty uh, uh, substance, omega-3s and 6s combination, that's believed to be important in the development of the eyes and the brain. Um, and it had previously never been isolated or manufactured before. And now, after the NASA discovery, uh, it's in everything. Uh, you can find it in olive oil and peanut butter, in yogurt, in, in milk, and, uh, and you can, of course, of course find it in uh, the infant formula sold all around the world. So those, those are two kind of far-reaching examples, um, the, the cell phone camera and the infant formula. Um, but, but you'll find us everywhere. Uh, you cannot get on an airplane today that hasn't benefited from NASA research. Uh, biomedical advances, uh, including um, uh, advanced ultrasound um, protocols and techniques, um, for our uh, ability to keep our astronauts safe in space. Um, uh, uh, materials, sciences, um, uh, every package that gets delivered today from FedEx or UPS benefits somehow from, from, from NASA's technology. Knowledge provided by um, our, our spacecraft, and whether it's Earth sensing or weather satellites, um, all of these have benefited from our, our investment in the, the, nation's, um, um, the nation's investment in aerospace technologies. So, as we develop these technologies, we have a specific drive for why we're doing it, but we don't always know what we can do also with it. That, that's not always something that we're, that we're as good at. You know, we, you, get, you bring a technology and you say, you know, what, what, else, what else can you make of this? You know, it looks like a piece of paper. You can turn it into a hat. You can fold it into a boat. You can turn it into an airplane. Um, you can do all kinds of things with it, but, but we often don't have all of those ideas. And that's why we've, we've worked with the company Marbler to, to help us uh, tap into the untapped cognitive surplus that exists in, in, in the world. There are a lot of people with other ideas for how they can use our technologies, be they um, uh, sensors or, or mechanical um, uh, devices or software. So for a full listing of all the technologies we have available, technology.nasa.gov is your best source. For a rundown on, on two of your technologies, uh, two of the technologies that, that, that we've got available right now, you're in the right place. Uh, the first one's going to be from a guy named Mike Tinker out of Marshall Space Flight Center who developed uh, a, a technology for inflatable structures that are rigidized with, with foam. Uh, he'll talk to you about that and some of the ideas that we've come up with for how that can be used. And then Fred Schramm, also from Marshall Space Flight Center, will talk to you about a reliable two-component tagging system, keeping track of things, uh, like, a, like a barcode, but a little bit more reliable. So each of those guys is going to have five minutes uh, to, to explain their technology. Uh, first, Mike. And then, and then Fred, but between the two of them, there's going to be a 10-minute question and answer period so that you guys can, can ask any questions you've got. They'll come in to me, I'll ask the questions, they'll respond to them. Uh, after Mike and Fred have talked, we'll turn it over to Dan Perez from Marbler, and he'll talk to you about crowdsourcing, Marbler, the NASA relationship. That's about another five minutes. And then I think we have maybe 15, 20 minutes left at the top of the hour 
for general questions. And those will come in from, um, from you. Uh, we'll, you can send them to us through Twitter, through uh, Google Plus, um, and we will answer them. And if you don't get answers to your questions now, we, we all exist outside of this framework, you can contact us too, and we'll put contact information up as well. So now without further um, delay, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Tinker from Marshall Space Flight Center to talk about his technology and, and all that it can do. Hello. Uh, I'm the Deputy Center Chief Technologist at NASA Marshall, and this morning I'd like to talk to you about a technology that we've been developing for a number of years here at Marshall. But first I'd like to acknowledge Andrew Schnell, who is my co-inventor for this technology. He's an engineer in the Advanced Concepts Office here at Marshall. But this technology deals with inflatables. I'm sure many of you can imagine why NASA would be interested in inflatable structures. First, uh, these structures are extremely lightweight uh, compared to metals, most composites. Uh, and secondly, inflatables can be packaged into a very small container, such as a cylinder or a box, launched into space, and then deployed in orbit uh, often making a very large structure for various applications there. However, there's also a very significant disadvantage uh, to the use of inflatables in space. Obviously, uh, these structures are susceptible to damage from micrometeoroids or debris impacts. And such an event could puncture the structure uh, and destroy it, ending the mission. Fortunately, uh, this risk can be mitigated by filling the inflatable by foam, uh, therefore enabling the structure to survive impact from very small debris in the space environment and to continue the mission. The use of foams uh, to deploy and rigidize structures in space was first proposed as early as the 1960s. Uh, and more recently, NASA, the Air Force, and other labs have researched this technology uh, for space flight. Uh, most of these investigations, however, have focused on solid cross-section structures, such as this tube, that's completely filled with foam. Uh, the problem with this is that if it's a very large structure, it can take a lot of foam to fill it, as you can imagine. And believe it or not, a structure completely filled with foam could be uh, too heavy for the application. So that's where this patented technology comes in. Uh, instead of completely filling the structure, uh, we, we developed a means for filling the walls of the inflatable, but leaving the innermost cavity open. Uh, this can yield significant weight savings while still maintaining the strength and the stiffness that you would need for the application. There are a number of shapes or forms that this technology could take for space applications, including tubes, like I've shown here, uh, panels, uh, spheres, domes, uh, trusses, and a number of other shapes uh, that could be used in the space environment. And for space applications, what we're interested in is satellite structures, solar concentrators for power and propulsion, habitats, uh, and others. So how does this innovation work? First, the structure is packaged in a container such as a cylinder or a box. Then the structure is deployed by pressurizing the innermost cavity such that the structure comes out of the container. And then finally, the structure is completed by injecting foam between the inner and outer walls. Um, the foam is allowed to completely fill the structure, uh, producing a system that can be used in space. Um, inlet ports and hoses are needed to inflate the structure and to inject the foam and then exhaust ports are required at the other end to allow gases to escape that have been produced uh, during the distribution and curing of the foam. All right. Um, in keeping with the theme of this Google Hangout event, I'd also like to mention uh, some commercial uh, Earth-based applications for this technology. The theme of this event being uh, discover new uses for out-of-this-world technologies. Uh, some of those could include components of very lightweight aircraft, uh, storage shelters, 
uh, housing, including emergency shelters after natural disasters, uh, containers, even sales displays, and uh, people involved in, in the process of having us think about this have, have come up with many other ideas for the technology. And in closing, I'd like to refer you to the Marbler website where you can go read more about the technology, better understand the details, and learn more about, uh, about the technology and how it can be used. And with that, I'm willing to take some questions from those online. So thanks, Mike. Have there been to date any um, commercial applications of this technology? Any, any spin-offs or tech transfer related to, to this? Uh, we're currently involved in uh, discussions uh, with Marblar and uh, with others, including small companies that have SBIR contracts and that type of thing. And uh, there's been a lot of interest in the technology. And uh, just really within the last few weeks or, or a couple of months, uh, we've entered into discussions with those folks um, to apply the technology for development of commercial products. So we have a question coming in from, from Twitter uh, from Rob C. And the question is, can you make foam from moon dust? I do think it's possible. <laughs> I recently uh, had someone ask me, could you fill these structures with concrete? <laughs> and, and there's no reason why you couldn't. You know, it, you, you could inject concrete made from uh, lunar materials or or, or whatever kind of material uh, you wanted to explore. But the answer is yes. I mean, the foam does not have to be a polymer per se, but as long as it has a substance such that you can either inject it between the walls or pour it in, uh, you can certainly build a structure uh, using this technology. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have another question that came in uh, from Google Plus. Mm -hmm. um, are these inflatable structures in any way related to the work that Bigelow Aerospace is doing? Are you, are you familiar with? Yes, I'm very familiar uh, with the with the Bigelow uh, space station. The technologies are similar uh, in that uh, both are based on inflatables, where you deploy a large structure from a very small package once you reach orbit with it. So the similarities are there. Uh, the differences come in the types of materials that are used for the inflatables. Uh, Bigelow Space Station, of course, would, uh, would not utilize a, a, a film uh, on the outer surface, mo most likely, like we're showing here. Um, uh, the, the space station would have a material on the outside uh, that can uh, withstand um, UV, impacts from small debris, things of that nature, provide insulation. Uh, so, so the materials used to make the walls in the space station could be significantly different than what we're talking about here. But there are great similarities uh, in the technologies. Uh, one other difference is that for Bigelow Space Station, I don't think they're injecting foam between the walls uh, as we're proposing uh, in this invention. So, um, speaking of, of the, the material that it's made out of, but another question just came in. Uh, it, it asks, is, is that structure, is the film made of polyurethane? Uh, the film is a polyimide, uh, and the foam uh, is polyurethane. Okay. Um, so, so that opens up a, a, a good discussion, though. I mean, the, the external material could be a film, it could be a fabric, uh, it could be foil. Uh, it could be, for example, a reinforced composite, flexible composite that's, uh, uh, that's deployable. There are a number of materials that could be used, but in this case, the foam that fills the walls is polyurethane. It can be a one-part uh, foam, it can be two-part, uh, and the, uh, the properties of that foam can be varied depending on the design of the structure. So in, in the... Uh, this isn't my question. It's another one that came in through, through the Google Plus. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in its current application, for the space application, how, how long does it take to inflate? How long does this entire process take? 
it completely depends on the size of the structure. Uh, a small structure like this uh, could be deployed in a matter of, of minutes. and You, you would want to do it in a slow control process to avoid damaging the structure. But if you were deploying a very large structure in space, uh, deployment uh, could, could take up to an hour or hours. It, you just want to do it in a very controlled process so that you don't damage the structure and lose the mission. It completely depends on the size. Thanks. Uh, another quick note before the next question is we have a, a sixth grade class that's joining us. Um, we'd like to, to welcome them to the event. That's kind of fun. They got some kids in here. Great. Um, so it looks like they're working on an engineering design uh, curriculum. So th this will be right in, involved with with, uh, with with that line of um, uh, inquiry. So if if I could, uh, they have a question I'd like to ask. Uh, of you, and then I have my own question for them. Sure. And the first one is: is can you summarize again what what this technology will do for NASA? And this is from the from the sixth graders. Sure, uh, NASA has been interested in this technology for for many years, and uh, the initial interest was to use it to build uh, satellite structures in space. And in particular, we were looking at solar concentrators that, that would be very large, could be packaged in a container, launched into space, inflated and deployed there to, to make a large concentrator. That structure would focus sunlight down to a point and use it either uh, for electrical power uh, or to heat a propellant uh, for a rocket engine. This was our initial interest at NASA Marshall for this technology. But, uh, but many researchers have also realized the technology could have many applications, including habitats, uh, such as on the moon's surface, uh, maybe on Mars' uh, surface in the future, even on an asteroid. Um, so there are a number of potential applications that, that NASA is interested in. Uh, but again, we started out looking at it uh, for propulsion and power applications uh, from NASA, NASA Marshall's perspective. Th thanks, Mike. Um, and then one, one more question that for, for Mr. Carter's class. Um, and this is a question I'm making up. Uh, so how do you get to work for NASA? It's, it's off the technology question side, but, but just there's a group sure. of sixth graders listening. And how, how do you get to work for the space agency? Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to answer that question. Uh, I have three kids of my own and, and we've tried to encourage them to, to prepare themselves for good careers. But I think the first step, uh, if you're interested in working for NASA, I'll speak uh, from an engineer's perspective. Uh, you need to have a strong interest in math, physics, uh, and, and the other sciences, uh, any of those other sciences. You need to enjoy those type subjects in school. And if you do, if you find yourself <clears throat> really enjoying math and science, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in, your, in your school classes, that's a, that's a good indication. Uh, from there, you would need to go on to college, of course, and obtain a degree uh, in a math or science or engineering field. And then that would position you very well for an engineering or science career at NASA. Uh, but, but we do a lot more than science and engineering. If some of the students are interested uh, in, in being a reporter, uh, you know, in, in public affairs, uh, in graphic arts, all of those are, are services that NASA requires as well. And we have pro professionals who are very good at, at producing art or graphics or news articles for us. So it's, it's wide open as far as careers go. But I just encourage the kids to pursue what they really enjoy doing, and and hopefully that would lead them to a career uh, within NASA. Uh, thank you, sir. That's a, a very nice, thoughtful answer. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, we we have a couple more questions on this particular technology, uh, but we're going to move on to the next one and then save some of those questions for the Q and A uh, session at the top of the hour. Um, so, uh, thank you, Mike. And now we'll move over to uh, Fred Schramm, who's developed uh, a different technology. This is a tagging system for um, inventorying um, uh, items. And he'll give you much more detail than I could. Uh, and now we'll, we'll turn it over to Fred.
And uh, Fred? Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I am Fred Schramm. I uh, was a, uh, an engineer with NASA for 30 years and retired two years ago. And one of the focuses that I had while I was there, one of the technology focuses, uh, was in automatic identification. There was a, we, we found that uh, there was a, a very significant uh, uh, area of opportunity for improvement in NASA. Uh, did some early studies that found that just within one of our projects, like building a shuttle's external tank, we would collect as much data each day as a normal grocery store, as, as, no, as much as 25 normal grocery stores. So a lot of data errors were taking place, and we looked for ways to improve our accuracy in collecting data. So people wouldn't be writing down the wrong numbers, typing in the wrong numbers, and what, that led us to barcode. That led us to marking little barcodes like data matrix symbols on parts directly. And then that led us, uh, led me into some, some specialty technology such as this one of reading these symbols, which is the identity of the part, through things like paint, through fi films, paints, uh, and other coatings. So that, that led us into some, some, some really interesting technologies. Uh, this particular one uh, goes a little beyond just reading through paint. It is a uh, it is a verification process. So uh, uh, let me let me uh, call your attention to the Marvel website, which which describes the technology very well in summary fashion. Also has a, a link to the patent there, and you'll see there are two aspects to uh, this technology. One is a micro aspect, and the other is macro. So, my, and the micro uh, uh, aspect, you can imagine, uh, we were we were seeing some problems with uh, counterfeit electronics at that time. Sometimes NASA has electronic electronics built uh, uh, for a designed need. Other times they buy electronics like PC boards and other things uh, off the shelf or from commercial sources out of warehouses and so on. There were there were there were some problems at the time with some of these electronics having been scrapped at some point, cleaned up, and then recycled, and you really couldn't tell the difference. And you were buying old electronics that looked new. The the uh, the application here is to put an identity on the electronic uh, component back when it was new in a way that that uh, if that couldn't be destroyed and could be detected if it were recycled as a counterfeit and uh, that that the process was uh, twofold as you can read there in the summary one was to apply a symbol such as a data matrix barcode or whatever uh, printed directly on it and the other was to apply a, uh, an invisible mark, one that involved a chemical tagant or just a chemical that had different elements in it like bromine or, or a copper or anything like that in a certain amount that when read with an x-ray fluorescent device, a handheld device, it would give a particular signature and that would be matched to the, uh, to the serial number on the uh, component. So you'd have two identifying uh, uh, aspects of, of the technology on that one component. You'd have the barcode or the data matrix which has the part number and serial number encoded. And then you'd have the, uh, the signature of the invisible mark which is a chemical tag. It could be just put on somewhere on the, on the, on the let's call it a PC board or you could have it painted over uh, and where you couldn't see it and then read it with that handheld device. Uh, you could also, within that device, since, since it is designed to have a camera and an x-ray fluorescent capability, you could register the relative locations of the, the mark that you could see and the one that you couldn't see. 
you could include a third lo uh, third aspect uh, as far as a feature on the PC board that you could triangulate with those and make sure even a defect on it you could include that in the in the verification process as as uh, registering the complete unique identity of that component. Uh, an X-ray fluorescent handheld is is like a barcode scanner with a handle on it, and a uh, and it has a, it would have a camera in it. So uh, we have had one company build one of those without a camera. We've had another company uh, build something like that with a camera. Neither company finished the product, but we've had we've had some development in both both uh, directions. So we were partially there uh, in the in in the aerospace application. But that was the micro application, uh, and and to to scan X-ray fluorescence, it takes a few seconds for the X-rays to determine what the material is that you're you're uh, reading and develop the signature. So it's not real fast. It's a verification process. The macro application was the, the example we gave was was lunar. At the time, we were we were doing a lot of lunar development, and one of the one of the opportunities that they were looking for is can we mine the materials we need to make fuel to go on to Mars? Uh, one of the, and we had even approached uh, Ames uh, Research Center on this. To use X-ray fluorescent handheld to determine what was in the rock or in the uh, in the material uh, on the moon surface, and if you found a material or a vein of material that was that was uh, of interest uh, for making fuel, you could determine that with the with the uh, X-ray fluorescent mounted on the end of a of a of a robot on the lunar rover uh, robot arm. You you could uh, our macro application was. What if you find several places on the moon's surface that have interesting material? What if you leave and some and later come back, either the same astronaut or different astronaut, or three months later with with another with another landing? How do you find those same locations? So we said you can find you can find the coordinates easily enough, but how do you find the exact place? On that rock or in that cave, so we said you could use the same system to to with the camera to register the some shape or form on that particular surface as a registration point. Use that as your as part of your identity, and then know within that triangulate over to the exact spot where you originally uh, analyzed the material there, and that's one way of finding the exact spot. Now, that has that also has a uh, has an Earth application in that if you were looking for corrosion in pipelines and uh, the corrosion is under paint, you find that corrosion using the handheld X-ray fluorescence because uh, steel will have a different signature than 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 rust than corrosion. So. You find that through your paint. Uh, you, you can mark near it a symbol. Uh, you can register that location, and you can come back to that same spot later on and see if that corrosion has gotten any worse. Uh, you could do it with the same person. You could do it with a different person. You could do it 10 years later. And and with that registration, uh, come back to the same spot and do, this, do a reanalysis. Same way with things like if you had if you had forensics in a room marking a place on the carpet or anything like that, it's being able to come back to the same spot and and identify what is there the same way. So uh, with that, I'll I'll take questions. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Uh, great summer, great, great overview. Really appreciate it. Uh, also good to hear about some of the potential commercial applications. Uh, so. One question that came through here is, you're being retired and all, and I don't know the answer to this one. If somebody were interested in taking this technology and commercializing it, would they still have access to you? 
first of all, if they licensed it through NASA, which which they would, then uh, uh, as a NASA in, once a NASA inventor, always a NASA inventor. So yes, they would have access to me through NASA uh, to work for them. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, and what you mentioned that that a couple companies had taken interest in this and and moved in some directions uh, uh, in the aerospace realm, um, but weren't successful in bringing the product to market. Can can you you know, without getting too much into the gory details, give us some ideas of some of the challenges that are involved in taking this from a NASA application to an industrial commercial application. Sure, um, one of the one of the uh, prohibitive factors in in, uh, in carrying this commercial is the cost of the scanner. An X-ray fluorescent handheld, and there are many companies out there that provide those and, and do a real good job with the technology. Uh, uh, one like this is a standard. It'll cost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for the scanner, and to put a camera in it does not increase the cost very. It's it's minor, really. Uh, we actually have you can use a wide angle, or you can use uh, some of the lenses that we had in another application that would read a mark fifty feet away, and then you could walk up to it and and so on. The it, the cost was prohibitive because in the identification world of uh, reading barcodes and data matrix symbols and so on, uh, the market is used to $500 or less scanners. And to, to have one that, that um, is fifteen to $20,000, uh, they would go into sticker shop. What they didn't realize was they would, say, they would come to me and say, uh, we have a problem with counterfeit pharmaceuticals. And it's a two billion dollar problem. Uh, can you solve it? And unless, if you say, yeah, I can solve it for twenty thousand dollars, the the sticker shock still existed. So you had to question: Did you have a two billion dollar problem, or did you have a five hundred dollar problem? And the, the the question was not answered. So it, uh, this is they have to realize this is not a production process. It is a verification process. And if it's you can you don't have to have one at every point of sale and every every checkpoint. Only at certain control points do you have to verify uh, whether your product is counterfeit or not. Not everywhere, just at control points. So although so it costs it's high cost to set up a station for reading and verifying, but you don't have to have very many. Thanks. So. It, it sounds as if there are a couple challenges to overcome in getting this thing from uh, the technology from uh, uh, the NAS application in, into market. Can, can you talk about the role of um, patenting and licensing in um, aiding that process? Well, of course, the, uh, the first role was to take it from idea all the way to uh, uh, in, uh, through the patent process, and then we, and after the patent process, there's something you call reduced to practice. And we were in the reduction to practice uh, uh, phase of that uh, when I retired. Also, about that time, the two companies we were working with fell prey to the economy, and and they decided not to take take on new ventures at that time. So the the economy was as much to blame uh, as uh, as uh, the cost of the of the scanner itself. Thank you, sir. And we have we have one more question. This this going comes from a high school calculus uh, class, uh, and the question is: So overall, what is novel about this technology that 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 um, uh, makes it unique from previous technologies? Is, is there one or two things that really sums this up that, that, that puts this ab uh, above and beyond other available technologies? Two aspects that make it novel. First of all, the uh, the use of a a chemical tagant which may hold as many as ten elements in there uh, in a in a particular amount for each element. To provide a a determined signature, 
So when you, your X-ray fluorescence reads that, you will get a predetermined signature uh, in that. That's part of the identity. The other, uh, the other novelty is coupling that with either a known identity marked on that particular object or a known feature, uh, a bump or a defect or a scrape or some known feature on the object itself near that particular uh, tagant. The tagant uh, the can, uh, can be covered with paint or a film or whatever. X-ray fluorescence will read through that much material. So the novelty there is two technologies working together, one of them is hidden. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And, and we'll, we'll get back to you a little bit later in the hour with uh, a couple additional questions. Um, in the meantime, though, I'd, I'd like to, to turn this over to Dan Perez. Um, and, and Dan will talk about how he's helping NASA to crowdsource ideas for some of these these and other technologies. As, as you can tell, we've, we've got um, these, are, these are two of, of over a thousand patented technologies. Uh, and then past our patents, we've got another thousand pieces of software. We have, we have so much technology that we're trying to share with industry, but we don't always know how else they can be used. And Dan Perez is helping us with that. His company, Marbler, is uh, uh, trying to tap into uh, uh, science, uh, citizen scientist communities and, and the, the population in general and, 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 and get ideas for how we can take technologies like Mike's and like Fred's and, and get them out to industry. So um, uh, enough out of me. Uh, Dan Perez. You'd like to tell us about uh, Marble or crowdsourcing in NASA? And Dan, I think you're on mute. There we go. Sorry about that. So um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about Marble specifically, but I did want to, uh, you know, touch upon the, you know, the problem and the difficulties on commercializing technology because that plays back into the the. The relationship and what we're doing with NASA and why why this is such an exciting initiative and why it's so exciting for everybody watching to get involved with with the NASA technologies that are online right now to figure out new ways to use it. So um, obviously the, the fine folks at Marshall Space Flight Center are constantly trying to commercialize their technology using what has been developed at NASA to find new ways to use these products in, in our everyday life. So Marbler, as, as a lot of you may know, is a product development company, and we try to turn this science, science from NASA, science from other people, into new products. And we do that by letting anybody from around the world to suggest new ways that they could use the science. Now, you might ask yourself, you know, why is this relevant? Why, why would we need a lot of help in creating um, uh, uh, new products from science? So actually, there's a huge amount of, of research that's going on in the world. Um, NASA, there's, you know, billions of dollars in research, but if you just focus just on academia, um, there's about $65 billion that was spent last year on academic R&D just in the U.S. And that resulted in about you know 11,000 plus patent filings. But of those 11,000 plus patent filings, less than 5% of them are getting commercialized. So 19 out of every 20 patents coming from university settings and from go government research settings are often lying uncommercialized. And so the ROI, and that's you know, taxpayer money, um, especially from universities who are predominantly taxpayer funded and philanthropy funded, you know the ROI is you know usually two to two to three percent, and so there's a big gulf between turning science um, that's happening uh, all around us and all the universities in the U.S. into new products, and that's and that's where you know people at uh, at tech transfer offices step in, and where where Marbler stepping in in this initiative is. So people are allowed to post patent or we post patents on the platform. We allow anybody for, to to find out new problems that market problems that these patents could solve, and then we develop the most promising into new products and. What's exciting about turning science into new products, um, and for anybody interested in, in you know, developing some of NASA's technologies into new, new products or universities' technologies into new products, is that you know, when you work with something that's already patented or with some um, research that's already been done, you kind of get a running start. Uh, so if you approach the people at Marshall, approach the people um, at, at JPL or some of the other um, NASA centers about some of their technologies, you know, they've already spent a lot of time exemplifying it and they patented very well and so you didn't have to, you know, worry about some of that early stage R&D. Uh, so you also remove a lot of the risk and the cost associated with that early technology development because it's already been done. You also, since you're starting with a patented technology, you're going to save your development time and 
w with the Marvel Initiative, and what's, what gets me excited as well, and I hope gets Marshall and other people excited as well, is that we're also engaging a community to be able to come in and take a look at these technologies um, to help us move them forward. And a lot of you might be wondering, hey, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a rocket scientist, obviously, because I don't work at NASA. I, I work in another engineering firm, or I'm a school teacher, I'm a student, and I want to, you know, reassure all the all the students who are watching today and everybody else who might not be a scientist who's watching today that all the technologies that are listed and all the technologies that are listed with, with NASA and everybody else, we break them down such that non-experts can understand. Because our big goal with uh, with this initiative is to ensure that um, non-experts could come at the technology from different angles and to share their insight and come up with ways to use Mike Tinker's technology that Mike never would have wouldn't have thought of, or to come come up with ways to use Fred's technology that Fred would never have thought of. And that's the big goal of of Marvler and this whole initiative is to be able to tap the creativity of people from all around the world and to reassure you, you don't have to be an expert to be able to understand the technology that's been um, that's been presented to you. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a little bit quite a bit about the the initiative and what we're doing. And for those people who are looking to submit some product ideas um, on Marbler, you know, it, do do think around you know the novelty and how how your product idea um, would compare to, uh, to existing product ideas. Maybe maybe the, it doesn't exist at all. You know, look at the look at the patent for every single one of the the uh, patents on Marbler. We link to the to the patent on Google Patents. So look at would the patent actually enable that product concept. Um, and look at the technology readiness for that sort of um, product idea. Would you have to significantly alter Mike's technology or significantly alter Fred's technology in order to make that happen? And then obviously look at the market size as well. But um, that's kind of the, the quick and dirty of what we're doing with, with, uh, with NASA here at Marbler and uh, a little bit around tech transfer and, uh, and the problem we're trying to solve. Back to you, Dan. Thanks, Dan Perez. Uh, and thanks also to uh, to Mike and to Fred. Uh, and now we're going to open it up. I think we've about 18 minutes left. I'd like to open it up for um, uh, general questions, or we've got a couple other questions that came in through Twitter and Google Plus um, for our two inventors. And um, um, now is the time to start shuttling questions in. We got somebody sitting right here with the, another laptop open, and she, she's feeding us content. Um, so here, here's one. Uh, and this one is uh, for, we'll start with Mike and then we'll, we'll move on to Fred. And the first question um, uh, is for Mike, and that's, um, what's the most exciting project you've worked on while at NASA? Well, sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, I, I think working, uh, two things, I think working with the International Space Station and with the space shuttle would have to be uh, the two most exciting things I've done. Um, you know, you can look up on a clear night, and if you know where to look, you can see the space station uh, passing by overhead. Uh, you know, knowing that those astronauts are on orbit, they're conducting uh, groundbreaking research, and that we have this phenomenal facility in space, uh, with international participation. That is extremely exciting. And then, uh, of course, uh, having worked with the shuttle, uh, I was involved with an investigation team uh, to uh, help find out why foam uh, was coming off the external tank, uh, another connection with foam for me. Um, but that was very interesting, very rewarding. We were able to help solve that problem, help to get the shuttle back on ground, uh, into the air uh, several years ago and flying again. Uh, so, so doing work that leads to space missions, uh, you know, you've got hardware flying in space, you've got crew operating that hardware, uh, that's very exciting to me. Uh, so, so those would be my top two. Sorry, <laughs> trouble finding the, the, the mute button there. Uh, I, I have I have two questions related to there's questions that we asked Fred also that I want to ask you about the, the foam. Um, first is is can, can you speak to the cost effectiveness of of that particular application? And then the follow up question to that, um, which I, I suppose I could just wait and ask you the follow up question afterward, but I'll give you a chance to start thinking about it in the back of your brain. Um, is are there household applications, you know, um, uh, countertop type applications that you can think of for this for this foam? And I guess that would also be a cost factor too, right? Um, getting it cheap enough that, that you could 
you have it be an everyday consumer item, and then what would that consumer item be? Uh, so cost, and then and then consumer items. Sure. Uh, interestingly, the particular foams that we used in these experiments, and as you can see in this test article, uh, these were off-the-shelf, very inexpensive foams that you can buy at your local hardware store. Um, so, and this was a fairly small structure, and it didn't take a lot of foam to fill it. But that gives you an idea uh, of the cost. Uh, I think for the most part, for particularly for commercial applications, um, you would be looking at inexpensive foams uh, that you could purchase off the shelf. Um, it depends on what you would do uh, with that product. If, if you really required high strength, for example, uh, you would probably need to involve foam researchers to design the foam to have the properties you needed. So it would get more expensive in that case uh, as far as an upfront investment in a product. But once the foam had been developed, uh, you would not need to continue that investment. So that would be an upfront cost. But for the research we did here at Marshall, we were simply using very inexpensive uh, spray or poor uh, foams uh, that we could buy at a local hardware store. Uh, your second question was about household applications. Uh, one application we've thought about is kind of related to plumbing. Uh, you know, you have to insulate uh, your pipes during the winter and uh, you could use this type technology for a pipe insulation, for example, and in that you, you would wrap the structure around a pipe, inject the foam into it, and it would cure, and then uh, you would have the insulation uh, left there in place. Uh, that's just one uh, household application. Um, so, any other questions related to that? Uh, some of those I would want to refer to Dan uh, with Marblar uh, because he's involved with some very specific ideas. So uh, actually let, let's hop to, to Fred next and then I, I do have some, some questions for and Dan Perez I'll give you a chance to start thinking about these. I, I'm going to ask you also um, what are some of the cool ideas you've gotten for how these guys technologies could be used. Uh, but in the meantime we had another question come in for Fred from uh, Google Plus and, and this one is uh, have you looked at using this technology in a bio biological or medical setting? Not in a biological or medical setting in the sense of a doctor's office or in a hospital. Uh, if it were in a hospital, it would be at the pharmaceutical uh, level where you'd be receiving uh, treatment products and you would, want, you would uh, use this to authenticate that they came from the source that you ordered them rather than uh, uh, from some third source counterfeit. Um, you hear of that happening quite a bit. It, it's, it's something that's in the, the entire pharmaceutical industry uh, and uh, your, your drug stores, your hospitals, they receive counterfeit medication. And this, this would be a way to verify uh, the, and authenticate the medication they're receiving as what they really ordered and from whom. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't. That would be that would be the medical application for this. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. And um, um, Dan Fred, yeah, can you talk us through some of the the, the cool technology? Uh, some of the cool ideas that you've gotten for how we can use these these two technologies, uh, or and maybe a. a, a a quick rundown on on some of the other technologies that, that, that we've got up on the Marbler site right now. Were you were you speaking to me or? So that was a question. Yeah, that was a question. Fred. Fred. Well, no, I think we may have I lost. Yep. So Dan Perez, can you hear us? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. I dropped off a second on my internet site, but I'm, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, what was your question? Sorry. <laughs> the question is, uh, can you walk us through some secondary applications, some of the new ideas that you've gotten for these two technologies, um, uh, Fred and Mike's technologies, and also what are some of the other technologies that are, that are up on Marbler now uh, from NASA that, that people have been interested in? 
and, and, and new applications for them. Sure, sure thing. And so one of the really, really exciting applications we had uh, for, uh, for Mike's technology was actually to use it as a rapidly deployable splint in emergency situations. So you'd imagine, given the foam is, comes quite compact and could expand, you know, depending on the type of foam you use, anywhere from 10x to 25x, you, you can have, you know, uh, a, a medical kit with, uh, with quite a few splints that are packed in quite tightly before they're deployed, and then the foam would be able to, to fit around around um, the, either the, uh, the limb that might be broken or, or sprained or this or that, um, form around whoever's, whoever's body it is, and then cure that is solidified, um, and then you would have a, a, a very rapidly deployable splint in certain emergency situations. You can imagine people taking that um, in hiking situations or outdoors. That was submitted by a gentleman named Carl Doolin and about six other people have been contributing to his idea as well. I, I believe Mike had mentioned another neat application for his technology in terms of um, emergency situations, actually you know, using this to quickly um, lift up debris um, after you know, a building collapses um, or during mine accidents. You would, you would obviously need some very, very strong foam. And as is a biochemist myself, not a material scientist, I, um, I couldn't say if the, it exists, um, that sort of a a uh, foam that would be strong enough to use safely in those sorts of situations, but it's a very clever idea and a, and a really neat um, unmet need that, uh, that his technology would potentially be able to solve. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of Fred's technology in this, uh, and two-component tagging, one of the most exciting applications I've seen is really, and Fred had touched upon it as well, and is one I want to really emphasize because I'm, uh, I'm quite uh, interested in it, is actually in counterfeit um, tracking counterfeits uh, and uh, authenticating consumables. But uh, what people might not appreciate is how much of a problem this is in, in the pharmaceutical industry. There are billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars every year worth of, of fake drugs that are distributed, um, and quite a few enter America as well. Um, and these, the, these positively have, an, have a, or should it negatively, certainly have a negative uh, impact on, on our health. And um, what would be really neat is to try to stay a, a step ahead of, of criminals and criminal syndicates by having this sort of uh, um, two-step authentication system. And as, as uh, Fred mentioned, it's actually quite powerful. You need to have um, ten different uh, uh, types of identification that you'd be able to do, and it's quite modular. Um, and so for certainly for, for drugs, which is a, a you know, in the tens of billions that are counterfeited every year, both in America and abroad, it would be a very neat way of pivoting, you know, a, a NASA technology to benefit human health. Um, other ways of, of uh, or other, you know, high-value goods that are commonly counterfeited include electronics as well. So most of us are confident that our iPhone is generally, you know, made by Apple, but, uh, but there are actually huge amounts of, of counterfeit electronics that, that you'll see out there, and so this sort of identification system would really help. Um, but, you know, I'd encourage everybody to take a look at marpla.com forward slash NASA. There's, a, there's dozens of, uh, and dozens of other NASA um, technologies and NASA innovations that are, um, that are there that are being, um, that, that, that people could come and, and try to commercialize. Um, one, one really neat one um, that I've actually really uh, enjoyed looking at. So there's a NASA technology. It's on very robust and, and um, precise mirror alignment. So as, as people could, uh, could imagine, NASA does quite a bit of research um, in terms of mirror alignments for astronomical observations. And um, these are usually very, very large devices. But what NASA's done is they've designed a system that is very accurate, very cost effective, um, and their, their curvature errors are much, much lower than other, uh, than other technologies. But uh, uh, in terms of some of the ideas that people have found, I've also in, in setting up rapid uh, free space optical links. So that is, you know, you're in the middle of, a, of the desert or you're just in, in the middle of a, of a battle zone for military applications. You need to quickly establish a Wi-Fi connection or communication connection. You could use this device and you be able to, to amplify any sort of satellite signal much, much quicker and actually use it for, for in the field um, communications, um, which is a really, really clever application. It's a, it's a demonstration of, of how you could engage a wide network to, to identify some, some different types of um, applications that the inventors might not have thought of. Another neat technology that NASA has developed was a sensor for measuring the speed of you know, very high temperature uh, fluids. 
um, somebody came in who's um, who's actually a researcher in Wisconsin. His name is Brian, and he felt well, what would be really neat application for this is to pivot it uh, from from space and orbital applications, it's actually for flow monitoring in next generation nuclear reactors. Um, so I'm not a, a nuclear physicist, but I found this application actually really, really interesting. He attached several images, and I encourage you all to take a look um, at some of the ideas for, for this particular technology and how you know, you'd know be able to pivot some NASA innovation into, uh, into the, the nuclear reactor. Um, there's, a, there's various other um, technologies there's, you know, that people could chew on. One particular that's, uh, that's gotten quite a bit of traction is a simplified way of storing ultra low temperature fluids. So you can imagine with you know their fuel cells and in various missions, NASA has to develop um, technologies for mission critical tasks and often you know part of those tasks involve you know storing ultra low temperature fluids. But there's a lot of ways here on Earth that we need to store ultra uh, uh, low temperature fluids as well in terms of cryogen uh, cryogenic storage in, in for service providers, a lot of biomedical applications when it comes to freezing tissues. Um, for medical research, um, it's gone applications for that, and so th those are just a few that I'm quite excited about. But I know I'm running out of time, so I should turn it back over to to Dan Lockney. Thanks. Uh, that's a, a great overview. I really appreciate it, Dan. Um, also, as as Dan Perez uh, mentioned, you're on mute, Dan. Am I? Okay. As Dan Perez mentioned, uh, marbler.com forward slash NASA is uh, one of the best places to, to go hear about all these technologies. Um, uh, another question just came in through Google Plus and um, uh, a handful of questions actually related to, so we're interested in this technology, now what? Um, what's the protocol for licensing? How do I get access to this stuff? Um, and I'll, I'll field that one. Uh, Generally speaking, uh, if you find a technology of NASA that you're interested in, you, you contact that field center directly, and, and uh, there will be a name and a contact information uh, uh, listed with, with any of our patents, with any of our technologies that are on this site. So you, you contact that person or contact me directly or contact um, uh, Google NASA Technology Transfer or technology.nasa.gov. There's a million ways to get in touch with us. Um, the first step is, is usually a research or evaluation license. And we can set you up with a six-month or 12-month exploratory period where you take the technology out. It's like a test drive. Um, uh, you can bang on it. You, you, can, you can see if it works for you. You, you can experiment with it. And, and you, you, you can see if it's really for you. If it turns out that it is for you, we, we do the next step, which is a commercial license. And we sit down with you. Uh, we work on some paperwork. We, we, draft, we draft that um, uh, an agreement that says you get to use this technology for your um, uh, uh, commercial applications. And generally, there, there is a royalty fee uh, that, that you pay us for the use of the technology. And that, that money doesn't just you know, um, uh, go back into the federal treasury. That, that, those dollars go, um, it's, it's a nominal fee, it's a couple bucks, and those actually go to the inventor, um, uh, most, mostly to the inventor. Uh, the other dollars get, get, get funneled into uh, patents, uh, patent maintenance fees and that, that type of basic work. Um, so it's a nominal fee. Um, it, it rewards the inventor, um, which is a, um, a, a, one of our, our legal requirements, and we're happy to do it. Um, so if you're interested in the technology, uh, innovation, uh, uh, I'm sorry, research or evaluation license, then a commercial license. Um, uh, so let's say you've got the patent, you've got the right to use it, you need some more assistance. As, as Fred mentioned, we're happy to provide that assistance. Our researchers will, will sit down with you. They'll, they'll, they'll talk you through it. Um, in some cases, we'll build um, test platforms. Will um, uh, help you prototype, um, and and that that all gets worked out. Uh, but in general, you know, if you're interested, interested in our technology, give us a call. It, it, it would be um, it's a lot easier than you might think. Um, so that that puts us at 12:59 Eastern time, and I think we have till one o'clock. Um, I'll go ahead and say uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, again, I'm Dan Lockney from uh, NASA Tech Transfer. Uh, if you so hold on. We didn't get to all the questions, but if you um, uh, uh, hit us up uh, through social media, we, we will get to them all. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mike Tinker for Marshall. I'd like to take, thank uh, Fred Schramm for Marshall. I'd like to thank um, uh, Dan Perez for Marbler. So thanks, everybody. It's been a fun hangout, and uh, look forward to doing it again sometime.